Dear students, the next lecture is about the retro peritoneum. Uh, the first uh, slide shows uh, the situation uh, after the removal of the internal organs in the abdominal cavity, and you see the uh, remaining uh, peritoneal ligaments uh, in a nice pattern. Uh, as you realized, here the liver is missing, and after the rem removal of the uh, uh, liver from the right hypochondrium, we see a line, the reflection line of the parietal uh, to the visceral peritoneum. This is called right coronary ligament, which is uh, uh, reflected posteriorly in front of the kidney, right kidney, as hepatorenal ligament. This is another refraction between the parietal and the visceral uh, uh, peritoneum layers. And the transition is called right uh, triangular ligament. On the left side, uh, the uh, two uh, reflections are relatively close uh, to each other. That's why these two together is called, uh, or are called left coronary ligament. And again, this transition here is the left uh, triangular ligament. You see a little bit the falciform ligament in front, which is coming down, you know, to the uh, uh, Navel. What else is seen here? Uh, this is the esophagus, and uh, here we see the superior horizontal part of the duodenum. So the stomach was removed as well, together with the spleen. So some ligaments are seen from the posterior body wall uh, to the spleen. Uh, this is called uh, phrenico uh, lienal ligament. Uh, above, if you have a direct connection to the stomach, this is the phrenico gastric ligament. And we know that the contention of the phrenico lienal or phrenico splenic uh, is the uh, gastro splenic ligament. This is not seen. Uh, here you see the famous hepato duodenal ligament as part of the lesser momentum. Uh, and it has important structures, what we describe later. And what you see is that uh, in front of the pancreas, because the pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ, so it is covered by the uh, posterior parietal layer of the peritoneum. So in front of it, we have a little bit uh, elevating uh, duplicate of the peritoneum called uh, transverse mesocolon. Now, if you look at the right and left uh, lumbar and then iliac region, uh, you see that uh, 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 corresponding to the ascending and descending colon, we don't have a tight duplicate. The reflections between the parietal and visceral peritoneum layers are quite far from each other. That's why these organs are regarded as rather retroperitoneal organ. So the ascending colon and the descending colon doesn't have a mesocolon, let's say. Uh, this is different uh, in the uh, sigmoid colon. Here we have again a duplicate close to each other. That's why the, uh, uh, the uh, sigmoid colon is regarded as intraperitoneal organ again. And the corresponding peritoneal ligament is called uh, sigmoid mesocolon, and it continues in the uppermost part of the rectum as mesorectum. I'd like to highlight this oblique line as well. Uh, this is a duplicate uh, of the uh, posterior peritoneum. This is where it is reflected into the visceral, and this will cover the uh, different parts of the small intestine, with the exception of the duodenum, which is left here behind the peritoneum. So the descending part of the peritoneum uh, from a certain level and then the inferior horizontal part is retroperitoneal, and from the duodenal jejunal flexure, which is this point, which is located on the left side at the level of the second lumbar vertebrae, uh, we have an oblique line. This is the root of the mesentery, the origin of the duplicate of the peritoneum to the small intestine, which is called the mesentery. This is the restricted mesentery, otherwise. And it leads down to the uh, right uh, iliac region. Here you see a tiny uh, duplicate, uh, it is to the appendix called mesoappendix. I think I mentioned uh, basically everything. Maybe I tell, I like to show this uh, ligament which forms a support for the spleen. In Latin it's called nidus lienis, which means nest of the spleen. Uh, otherwise this ligament is not related to the spleen, it connects the body wall uh, and the left colic flexure, that's why it's called uh, phrenical colic ligament. We can see this in the cadaver and we have to add uh, to the ligaments of the spleen. However, as I told you, it's not related directly to it. <clears throat> now, uh, regarding the development of the 
peritoneum, maybe you heard already on the practice already, uh, we see uh, in a lateral or from a lateral aspect in the midline uh, the GI tract having two loops. The first uh, smaller loop is the duodenal loop, uh, the larger one is the intestinal or umbilical loop. And uh, this is located in the midline and in front of the stomach, which starts to thicken at this level, we have the liver and behind the stomach, this tiny organ is the spleen. Now the black uh, duplicate, which is seen in a horizontal cut in front of the liver, behind the liver and then behind the stomach, uh, these are the uh, layers of the ventral and dorsal mesogastrium altogether. And with the development of the liver, you will, you will see this, it grows out from the uh, middle point of the duodenal uh, loop. Uh, so it grows in into this duplicate, as you see here, separating the original uh, direct duplicate from the uh, GI to the body wall into two parts. And the anterior part is the falciform ligament and behind, this is the lesser omentum, uh, having two parts, the major part, the longer part is related to the stomach. This is the hepatogastric ligament and the distal part is the hepatodudan ligament. As you hear, as you see here, this shows the, uh, the uh, distal end of the ventral mesogastrium, which doesn't extend down to the uh, caudal part of the embryo, in contrast to the dorsal mesogastrium, which descends until the rectum. So, uh, it can be a nice question on the exam, where is the termination of the ventral uh, mesogastrium in the body? The falciform ligament terminates in the round ligament of the liver, not seen, not labeled here, or ligamentum teres hepatis, and the lesser omentum terminates in the hepatoduodenal ligament. Now behind, as I told you, the dorsal mesogastrium extends down to the uppermost part of the rectum, having a little duplicate later called mesorectum, as I mentioned earlier. And it can be divided again into several parts with the development of the spleen. Uh, this is separated into phrenico, uh, splenic or phrenicolenal ligament behind and between the stomach and the spleen, the gastrosplenic or gastrolenal ligament. Above, where we don't have spleen, uh, the peritoneum is reflected directly to the stomach called phrenicogastric ligament. And if you come down, uh, we will see later the mesentery, which is related to the small intestine, and uh, part of the large intestine will be also intraperitoneal. We mentioned earlier the uh, transverse and the sigmoid uh, colon, and that's why they have also from this duplicate some uh, mesocolon. And uh, again, I like to highlight that it uh, descends until the distal point. Here you see otherwise the abdominal aorta, let me tell you this, and it has three major unpaired visceral branches, what I like to detail today. Uh, and the upper is called the celiac trunk, the uh, next one is the superior mesenteric artery, the third one is the inferior mesenteric artery. And uh, uh, they supply certain parts of the GI, and I want to highlight something that the uh, borderline between the foregut and the midgut is the outgrowth of the liver bud. So the liver bud, and this way the hepatocytes, the intra and extra hepatic epithel the duct epithelium, including the gallbladder epithelium, uh, will belong to the foregut, uh, also the pancreas. So until this point, this area is the foregut, and this is supplied by the uh, uh, celiac trunk, at least under the diaphragm, because the foregut starts much higher. And then uh, the next uh, borderline, which is between the midgut and the hindgut, is this, the primitive colic flexure here. And this corresponds uh, in gross anatomy to the transition of the proximal two-thirds and this still one-third of the transverse colon. And that's why this is the borderline in the blood supply between the superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric artery. This is where we have the, the uh, famous arch of Riolan. And uh, that's why it shows from embryology why. Uh, then we have a rotation, and that's why uh, the situation changes a bit. For example, the falciform ligament, uh, which is still quite anterior, uh, is here, and the uh, hepato 
uh, gastric uh, ligament uh, uh, rotates into this position. As you see, the liver is already on the right side, not in the uh, uh, middle uh, position. The stomach uh, rotated and the uh, spleen is on its left side. And the posterior, uh, uh, so the dorsal mesogastrium, with the two parts what I mentioned, uh, uh, seen here, this is the gastrosplenic and this is the phrenical splenic ligament. I like to highlight uh, this uh, pouch uh, of the peritoneum behind the stomach. This is the famous lesser sac or omental buza. And on this figure you see uh, how the pancreas uh, uh, becomes a retroperitoneal from the original intraperitoneal position. And uh, you see this uh, interrupted line, which was the original uh, situation, and then uh, it disappears. I mean, it ret retracted into this position. That's why the pancreas and the uh, descending part of the duodenum becomes uh, retroperitoneal. This is the rotation of the stomach and the duodenum, uh, 90 degree rotation from uh, left to the right. That's why the liver moves to the right side and the spleen to the left. This will be behind the lateral mantle or uh, omental bursa. And we have a, an additional 180 degree uh, rotation of the intestine together with the previous, it's 270, so that is only for the intestine. And this rotation is around the superior mesenteric artery, which runs in the axis of the intestinal loop or umbilical loop. This is the vital line duct otherwise leading to the uh, navel. And uh, this is counterclockwise rotation. And that's why here you see that this is the cecum originally, the ascending part of the uh, uh, intestinal or umbilical loop, uh, moves to the right upper part of the abdominal cavity and then descends to the uh, proper position. Uh, this is otherwise the borderline between the small intestine and large intestine. And this, uh, which is in the hairpin of the intestinal loop, is the elom. And uh, that's why uh, this outgrowth, the vital line duct, will be present or may be present on the elom as sometimes as a remnant as a Meckel's diverticulum or in some cases cyst or even ulceration can be present in this. Anyway, it may imitate the sign of the appendicitis. That's why you have to know this uh, option. And uh, how can you find it in surgery? When you find the uh, appendix, which would be in this region, because this is the cecum, then this will be approximately 60, 80 centimeters backward to the oral uh, direction. Uh, and uh, this is where you have to see whether on the elom you see any sign of inflammation, any malformation or not, which may cause the pain, let's say, in the patient. Now, this shows the proper rotation counterclockwise. If it's uh, clockwise and the opposite, then the duodenum will be superficial and the transverse colon will be behind. This is a possible uh, malrotation and uh, malformation of the midgut. You have to notice that together with the remnants of the uh, vital line duct as a Meckel's divertical. Uh, this is the rotation of the pancreas, uh, having a ventral and dorsal bud. The ventral moves more, rotates more, and then they unite. Here you see, at the same time, uh, the other outgrowth. This is the liver bud, this is the cystic bud, and the liver bud uh, gives the intra and extra hepatic duct epithelium lining, plus at the end the hepatocytes, this brownish. Don't forget, so these are all from the endoderm of the foregut. And uh, uh, the cystic duct and the epithelium lining of the gallbladder also. Uh, here you see the union, and this is the common bile duct, which leads down. But the common bile duct unites with this uh, duct, the duct of the ventral bud. But later on, with the fusion of the ventral and dorsal bud of the pancreas, the situation changes because, as you see, originally the dorsal bud has a distinct duct which opens a few centimeters above on the descending part of the duodenum. But here uh, you see the uh, union between the ventral and dorsal. The dorsal bud gives the tail of the pancreas, the body, and the upper part of the head. And the uh, duct of the dorsal bud unites with the duct of the ventral 
which gives otherwise the ventral part of the head. And this is the major pancreatic duct. This is which unites with the uh, common bile duct. So they open together on the famous uh, major duodenal papilla or papilla of father. The, uh, the very uh, proximal part of the dorsal duct uh, will be still above uh, uh, the uh, major pancreatic duct. This will be called accessory, and this opens on the minor duodenal papilla, also on the descending part of the duodenum. <clears throat> now, if we go back to this, then we understand why the duodenum now behind, at least uh, uh, from the distal part of the descending duodenum, uh, uh, behind the retroperitoneum, uh, and they these are the retroperitoneal parts of the duodenum. The first part, the superhorizontal part, until the liver bud, approximately is still intraperitoneal. That's why we have the hepatoduodenal ligament to that. And here you see this oblique line again, the root of the mesentery, from L2 on the left side down to the right iliac fossa. Uh, this is the duodenal jejunal flexure. And the rest of the small intestine, so the jejunal and the ilar loops, are all intraperitoneal. Uh, here you see the uh, line of the uh, transverse mesocolon. So the, uh, as you see here, the transverse colon was in front of the duodenum if the rotation is, uh, was proper. The other parts of the uh, ligaments were mentioned earlier. Maybe I mentioned this here as uh, so a kind of recapitulation. If we uh, open the abdominal cavity and we watch the posterior wall, uh, posterior surface of the anterior wall, we see five folds. In the midline, we have the median umbilical fold. This is made by the remnant of the Allantois or Urahus. We see the medial umbilical folds with the obliterated umbilical arteries, which carried the deoxygenated blood in the embryo. And the lateral umbilical folds uh, still contain functioning uh, uh, functional vessels, the inferior epigastric artery and vein. Now, uh, how can we divide uh, the uh, retroperitoneal organs and structures? We have organs, we have vessels and nerves. We have primary and secondary organs. Primary organs are those which develop originally in the retroperitoneum. So uh, right and left kidneys, uh, the right and left suprarenal or adrenal glands, and the right and left ureters. And the secondary retroperitoneal organs are those which uh, became uh, retroperitoneal later, originally they were intraperitoneal. So this is the pancreas, for example, certain part of the duodenum, the distal part of the descending part of the duodenum and the inferocentral part. Some people distinguish the ascending part, then you can add this as well. Uh, the ascending and descending colon I showed you, and the variable portion of the cecum, and certain part, uh, the middle part of the rectum. Uh, we have important vessels, I will list them later, all the branches of the abdominal aorta basically. Uh, two venous systems are behind, inferior vena cava and the portal vein, very important. And we have uh, different uh, lymphatic structures, lymph nodes and uh, uh, trunks and the uh, famous cisterna here, what you heard, and we have different, different nerves, nerves. This is what I want to tell. Now, uh, first the uh, pancreas. And I like to describe the so-called skeletotopy of the pancreas, which is quite important if you study an organ I highlighted already. You have to know the relationship of the given organ to the skeleton. In case of the pancreas, it is located quite posteriorly, so that's why it's uh, logically uh, related to the vertebral uh, column. The head of the pancreas is between L1 and L3, and then it's uh, obliquely elevated like this, here you don't see, that is the best, and the body is uh, around L1, and the tail may reach the 12th uh, thoracic vertebra when it uh, is in contact with the helium of the spleen. So the uh, skeletotopy is this. Here you see otherwise, uh, in the same page, I found uh, the rotation of the pancreas, the ventral and dorsal, but, and it shows a malformation when the rotation is not proper, and it is uh, still around the descending part of the duodenum, which has a little uh, narrow point called stenosis, and this phenomenon is called, as you see here, the annular pancreas, 
this is a malformation. But all these are from the endoderm until this point. Uh, endoderm of the foregut, I mean, uh, because the rest will be the endoderm of the midgut. Now, syntopy. That is also important, even more important than the skeletotopy. You have to know these structures, organs and vessels, and other uh, anatomical structures around the given organ. That's why you will see several numbers. The first one shows the major organs around the pancreas, at least partly. You see the head of the pancreas, which is surrounded by the duodenal loop. So the superior horizontal part, descending part, and inferior horizontal part of the duodenum. Then it obliquely crosses the midline. It runs and crosses the left kidney. And the tail uh, will reach the helium of the uh, spleen, which was removed from here. That's why we don't see. This is what you see uh, behind the pancreas. And in front of the pancreas, here the parietal, parietal peritoneum is added. Uh, we see the obliquely running duplicate in front. This is the transverse mesocolon, showing that in front we have the transverse colon. Uh, here you see now the spleen, and you see that the, of, uh, the uh, tail of the pancreas may reach the helium of the spleen. What was still removed is the stomach from here. The stomach would be from the esophagus down to the duodenum. And uh, we studied already that we have an important uh, peritoneal pouch between these two organs, between the posterior surface of the stomach, which is otherwise covered by visceral peritoneal layer, and the pancreas, which is covered by the parietal peritoneum. So this is the lesser sac or omental bursa. But if uh, we have inflammation in the uh, pancreas, or if we have ulceration in the stomach, these two layers of the peritoneum won't be a border uh, or separation between the two organs, so the inflammation, ulceration, the digestive processes can spread from one organ to the other. That's why you have to know the same gross anatomy, uh, because it will be important for internal medicine and surgery. Pancreatitis is quite, uh, you know, a serious problem. Uh, so this is still the syntopy, number two, with the other organs in front. And uh, uh, the parts of the pancreas I mentioned already, we have head, we have the body, and the uh, most uh, distal part is called tail. And inside you see the uh, duct system. Uh, I, as I told you, the distal part of the dorsal butt duct will fuse with the duct of the ventral bud, and they two together is the major pancreatic duct. This is which opens on the major duodenal papilla, and the remaining proximal part of the dorsal bud will give the access to the pancreatic duct, which opens a bit higher, but also on the descending uh, duodenum, but on the minor duodenal papilla. Some people, I mean, uh, 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 doctors uh, are able to uh, <coughs> fill the major duodenal papilla, or through the major duodenal papilla, the, uh, uh, door, uh, the major pancreatic duct with contrast material, so to see whether we have something uh, occlusion in the system or not, in case of a tumor located in the head of the pancreas or a stone which is entrapped in the common uh, entrance. Uh, this is called endoscopic retrograde pancreatography. Uh, still a syntopy of the pancreas. Now I like to focus on the bile duct system behind. Uh, here you see the common hepatic duct coming from the uh, liver. Don't forget, hepatocytes produce the bile continuously. And in some cases when we don't have digestion and here the sphincter of Odi is closed, the bile circles to the uh, uh, gallbladder to be concentrated. But if we have digestion, the sphincter is open, and from both uh, uh, ducts uh, to the common hepatic duct, we have release of the bile into the duodenum. So we have cystic duct, we have common hepatic duct. After the union, we have the common bile duct, and the common bile duct unites with the, com with the major pancreatic duct in the so-called ampulla, and they open together on the major duodenal papilla, papilla fater into the uh, duodenum descending part. But if we have a stone entrapped in the common ampulla, then the bile may circulate towards the pancreas 
and the bile acids may activate the enzymes in situ, causing a very serious uh, autodigestion of the pancreas, uh, because normally the enzymes will be activated in the duodenum only, because this uh, gives the acidic pH, this one the enzymes, and normally this mixture will be only in the lumen of the intestine, but in this case it may be in situ. Or if something uh, uh, compresses the uh, common ampulla, uh, for example a cancer in the head of the pancreas, the same phenomenon can be. Uh, and uh, if compresses, for example, the uh, common bile duct, you know, the bile is coming back, I mean the pressure increases in the intrahepatic uh, duct system at the end, in the bile capillaries and uh, destroying the tight junctions and if you remember the uh, bile capillaries are very close to the sinusoids which have fenestrated the wall so the bile can enter the circulation and that's why we have jaundice. Now this is what you see, the major pancreatic duct uniting with the uh, common hepatic duct, common uh, bile duct and this is the, uh, the accessory. These are the two uh, papillae, the major and minor to the papilla. Now, uh, next would be the abdominal aorta and its branches. I added three times three because we have three major systems and each has three uh, different branches. Uh, some of them have more, but it's okay. And uh, one which are uh, separate questions, uh, the so-called unpaired visceral branches of the aorta. Uh, this is the celiac trunk at T12, the supermesenteric artery at L1, and the inferior mesenteric artery at L3. This is what I mentioned already on the embryonic figure to supply the foregut, midgut, and hindgut according to this. Now, uh, these are for the unpaired visceral branches. I don't want to go into the uh, details now. The next one is the paired visceral branches. So, for example, right and left renal artery for the kidneys, right and left middle suprarenal arteries to the suprarenal glands, and we have the right and left gonadal arteries to the ovaries or testes. These are the uh, paired visceral, and again we have three pairs. And we have parietal branches, inferior phrenic, from where we have the superior suprarenal. We have some lumbar arteries, so this is a difference, not only one pair, we have four pairs of lumbar arteries, and we have one median sacral artery. These are on the body wall, so that's why these are called parietal branches. If we are here, I mentioned the upper two uh, vessels to the uh, suprarenal gland, we have an inferior suprarenal artery as well, which comes from the renal artery on both sides. Now if we add these vessels to the pancreas, that's why I labeled a syntopy of pancreas 4, uh, above the level of the pancreas we have the celiac trunk and below and behind the superior mesenteric artery which uh, descends uh, sharply and that's why it will uh, appear under the pancreas but the origin is somewhere here, quite close to the celiac trunk. Now the celiac trunk has the splenic artery to the left has the common hepatic to the right and the left gastric. These are the uh, tripod-like branches of the common hep uh, the uh, celiac trunk. And as you see, the uh, common hepatic then divides into proper hepatic and gastrododonal artery, and the gastrododonal artery gives the superior pancreatic ododonal arteries. We have an anterior and posterior, but we don't teach it. And they form anastomosis in front and behind the pancreas, with the corresponding inferior pancreatic duodenal arteries, which are from the supermesenteric artery already. So that's why this anastomosis or these anastomoses provide uh, uh, you know, connection between the two big systems. Otherwise, this is for the head of the pancreas, but the body and the tail will be supplied from the branches of the splenic artery. We have simply pancreatic branches. We have a big one as dorsal pancreatic. It runs on the posterior surface. Then it comes a little bit thicker branch, the uh, great pancreatic artery, and we have one more to the tail of the pancreas, uh, and uh, that's why this is quite important. <clears throat> uh, this is what you see here on a schematic drawing from behind. This is the anastomosis between the uh, dorsal and the great pancreatic artery, and then we have one to the tail. 
We don't uh, teach, I mean, uh, yeah, we don't uh, teach and require these branches, but you may find them in the surgery, that's why I teach it. And I like to highlight this angle. This is the abdominal aorta from a lateral spec. This is the superior mesenteric artery. And uh, as you see, this is the inferior horizontal part of the duodenum. So this is located in an angle. So uh, if somebody has chiaxia, in case of anorexia, let's say, uh, the loss of fat, which keeps this angle in proper position, is lower. And uh, the superior mesenteric artery can compress uh, the inferior horizontal part of the duodenum to the uh, abdominal aorta and uh, even uh, causes this way a blockade in the peristalsis, uh, further, you know, uh, blockade or uh, problem in the uh, feeding and uh, that's why it can be quite severe and should be operated somehow. Uh, I like to highlight it, this uh, anatomical situation. So in front of the inferior horizontal part of the duodenum, we have the uh, superior mesenteric behind the abdominal aorta. We have veins around the pancreas, but first I want to introduce this. And uh, I want to highlight something very important that in contrast to the arteries, which uh, are all from the abdominal aorta, in case of the venous uh, drainage, uh, it is shared between two big systems. One is the inferior vena cava, the other is the portal vein. The portal vein drains the blood from the unpaired visceral organs, very important rule, and the paired visceral organs, however, it's not symmetric, that's why it's uh, difficult. The, uh, the paired visceral organs will be drained to the inferior vena cava, also the parietal branches. Now, what are these? First, the inferior vena cava. We have right and left renal veins. We have gonadal veins, but only the right one is drained directly to the inferior vena cava. The left one goes first to the left renal vein. The same with the supra renal veins. The right one directly, the left one to the left uh, renal vein. And we have one more compared to the aorta. Here on the top, what students used to forget on the exam, before the inferior vena cava passes through the diaphragm, receive the blood from the liver. So these are the hepatic veins. Usually we have three openings here. Don't forget it. And we have the same parietal branches, inferior phrenic vein, some lumbar veins, four pairs usually, and the median sacral vein. So this is the same as the arteries were. Uh, this is the schematic drawing. I, I don't want to go in this. The difference, the asymmetry, is, uh, uh, of course, as always, can be explained by the embryonic development. Uh, the next one is the portal vein. The portal vein is unique. Don't mix with the branches of the inferior vena cava. However, we have some anastomosis between these the two systems, what you have to know. But originally, the portal vein, and this is the major rule, uh, collects the blood from the unpaired visceral organs. What are these? The GI, basically. The stomach, the uh, pancreas, I like to highlight it, uh, the uh, intestine, until the superior part of the rectum, and the spleen also. So, according to this, uh, the portal vein is formed by the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein. And then it enters the hepatoduodenal ligament. But we have other veins which uh, empty into the system. The inferior mesenteric vein, usually it empties as this uh, figure shows into the splenic. And this special one, uh, this uh, crown-like vein, in Latin it has a nice name as vena coronaria ventriculi. The English terminology doesn't use this, uh, just right and left gastric veins around the lesser curvature of the stomach. But this will be the most important uh, among the tributaries of the portal vein because it has anastomosis along the lower part of the esophagus with the esophageal veins which are drained as you studied uh, to the hemiosphagus and esophagus and then superior vena cava. So in case of portal hypertension which is a big problem in Hungary because cirrhosis uh, one tenth of the population due to the alcohol ethanol consumption uh, the blood cannot pass through easily to, uh, through the liver and starts to find other options to bypass the liver. And this is one option. Uh, the flow is the opposite in the portal part and goes towards the esophageal veins and the anastomosis enlarges as varices. And it can be hurt easily with a solid food 
And if you add that uh, these patients usually have malfunction, malfunctioning the liver doesn't uh, produce a uh, proper amount of anticoagulant factors, these two uh, together may cause fatal bleeding very often, unfortunately. So the original two, the supramesenteric and the splenic, we have others. Infiomesenteric with the same tributaries of the rise, what the uh, arteries have, and we have this right, right and left gastric veins called together vena coronary ventricle, or if I want to translate it to English, is the coronary vein of the stomach. And uh, as you see here, the uh, pancreas was removed, but you see that uh, basically the pancreas is drained to the uh, splenic vein mostly. And uh, you know, uh, uh, you studied already in histology that pancreas has a very important endocrine part, the longer hands islets, which produce uh, hormones, including insulin, uh, glucagon, somatostatin, and these are released into the circulation via these uh, veins. So portal vein is the crucial. Now we have important uh, uh, nerves and uh, ganglia behind the peritoneum. This is where the continuation of the sympathetic trunk is found. Uh, you see the paravertebral ganglia, and in front or around the unpaired visceral branch of the aorta, we have pairs of prevertebral ganglia, celiac ganglia, supramesenteric ganglia, infermesenteric ganglia. We have also aortic or renal ganglia. This is important for the sympathetic innervation of the kidney. And uh, uh, what I want to highlight is the fact, we studied this in the posterior mediastinum, that the sympathetic nervous system has outflow only uh, from T1 to L2, maybe C8, L3, so in, it is restricted to the thoracolumbar region. We don't have uh, origin in the brain, don't forget it, or distally, but the chain continues down even to the sacrum. So we have paravertebral ganglion chain still on the uh, both sides of the vertebral column, which unite at the end as coccygeal ganglion or ganglion of Weber at the end. So these are seen. You see also the uh, descending uh, greater splenic nerve, which uh, mostly terminate in the celiac ganglion, but this is which innervates the uh, medulla of the suprarenal gland as well. These are with details, and uh, here you see again the, uh, the prevertebral ganglia, the paravertebral ganglion chain, of course, they have usually a network. We have superior and inferior hypogastric plexuses, and I added in the list what they innervate. Uh, we don't ask this way uh, uh, right now, but uh, by the uh, final exam, we have this question sympathetic nervous system, so we may ask this later. And here it shows functionally the major uh, uh, things related to the sympathetic nervous system, what you have to uh, memorize is that the sympathetic nervous system inhibits the uh, digestion. So this way it decreases, it inhibits the peristalsis and inhibits the gland secretion. That is the major, if you look at this list. Uh, of course, uh, it is important for smooth muscle contractions in other parts, for example, the internal urethral and internal anal sphincters are under the control, uh, here you see, <clears throat> and uh, the ejaculation, what, we'll, uh, what uh, I will mention very soon, uh, will be uh, also under the control of the sympathetic innervation, so the male genital duct system, smooth muscle is also. We have important uh, lymphatic uh, structures uh, behind the peritoneum, uh, we have lymph nodes uh, started already, uh, in the femoral uh, region, then inguinal region, uh, and we call them according to the uh, uh, related, related vessels, especially the veins. So we have femoral, then superficial and deep inguinal lymph nodes. Then they follow the vessels, so we have external iliac, but we have the other one which is missing from the lesser pelvis, internal iliac lymph nodes, then common iliac lymph nodes as the veins. Then, and this is very important, in the clinical practice, this is called on each side of the aorta and the uh, inferior vena cava. We have lots of uh, altogether called aortic, paraortic lymph nodes or lumbar lymph nodes. So paraortic or lumbar lymph nodes. In the clinical practice, the paraortic term is used. And at the end, they enter the cisternochili as right and left lumbar trunk. 
But don't forget, we have a third one, the intestinal trunk, which carries the lymph from the intestine. So these three big trunks empty into the cisternal kidney, from where then the thoracic duct starts. The cisternal kidney is located at L1. And uh, we have nerves uh, in this region. We studied already the branch to the lumbar plexus in the first semester, but uh, now we are able to see them inside. Uh, we have uh, several, uh, and most of them are lateral to the obsess major, that is the landmark, the iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, then we have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, still the femoral nerve, the biggest one, still lateral to the uh, obsess major, these four uh, were mentioned already, and one of them uh, pierces the psoas in front, at least with one part. This is the gentle femoral nerve, and one will be medially, here we don't see this so well, medial to the psoas major, this is the obturator nerve. But don't forget the lumbar plexus, as you see here, is the fusion of the ventral RMI of the spinal nerves between the lower half of T12 and upper half of L4. Thank you very much for your attention.